Greetings, good morning. Hi. I'm delighted to be here with you. My name is Barry Nailbuff. I'm Milton Steinbeck Professor at the Yale School of Management. The one announcement from the house is if you would kindly uh, at least turn your cell phones to the vibrate mode. Uh, I, that would be appreciated. This morning's uh, talk is being recorded so that it can be I uh, podcast uh, for your colleagues, classmates, and friends. Uh, and that means that I'll be repeating all questions that come up. Uh, and when you do ask questions later, it would just come up to the mic. That would be terrific. I'm delighted to have the chance to present the work today uh, that I've done with my friend, my colleague, uh, and most importantly, Yale Class of 81, uh, co-author Ian Ayers. Uh, this is uh, from our book called Why Not? And the inspiration for today's talk comes from the line of George Bernard Shaw that Robert F. Kennedy made famous. Some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream of things that never were and say, why not? And that is a spirit that I'm going to try and recapture today, really going and problem solving, making the world a better place. Now, when I think about doing that, uh, what I want to bring together is this Yankee ingenuity, this sort of old-fashioned problem solving. Not that you need to have an engineering degree. Uh, I, I am from MIT, but uh, that is not uh, the approach that I want to take today. What I'm thinking about uh, are ideas that could have been done 15 years ago, like right turn on red. Uh, in fact, actually, right turn on red, for the most part, does not exist in Europe. Now, I know why England doesn't have right turn on red, but... Uh, <laughs> and so my uh, objective today uh, is to do the fun part of problem solving, the idea generation, the 1% one, one inspiration, uh, not the 99% perspiration. I know how hard it is to make ideas happen. Uh, in the time we have together today, I'm going to focus on coming up with great ideas. So my objectives are to inspire you, to help really energize you to go out and solve problems, uh, leave this world a better place than we found it. Uh, I want to give you some tools that will help you do that. Because to the extent I can help routinize, mechanize, uh, make uh, formulas, make uh, simple approaches to coming up with original ideas, that's going to make your job easier. That is, I'd like to be as non-creative as possible uh, in being creative. Uh, so the more that I can mechanize the creative process, uh, the easier it will be. I'm not trying to solve all problems, but I hope that we can solve many of them this way. Uh, of course, I want to have fun. We're here on a Saturday. Uh, but I also think, as you'll hear from the discussion, uh, that we really can change the world, that we've lost some of this approach to uh, how can we do things differently and better. Uh, part of our response has been to hibernate, to go back into our shell. Uh, and I'm suggesting that we're not going to solve our problems uh, simply by going back to the way we did things. We really need to come up with new approaches. And I hope to help you in that today. Uh, the way we do this is twofold. Half the time we start with a problem and look for the answer. And in that approach, we have two headings. One is we ask, what would Croesus do? And this is a crowd who actually might know that. Uh, what would somebody with all the gold do? How would they go about solving the problem? And then the other approach we do there is, where are incentives messed up? Where is it that people are being led astray and doing things wrong because they've been given poor incentives. And then the second half, what we do is play Jeopardy. We start with the answer and then try and figure out what's the good question. And there what we do is we turn things upside down and we ask where else would it work. Now, that's it, uh, except you have to go ahead and make it happen. So what I'm going to try and do is illustrate these four approaches throughout the talk. To begin with problems in search of solutions, let me give you my first problem. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. You're lying fast asleep. The phone rings. You pick it up, and you hear, ee! It is a fax machine calling your bedroom phone. What do you do? And since I'm a professor, I can call on people. So what do you do? You unplug the phone. The problem is you may have more than one phone in your house. And so the other phones in the house will start ringing five minutes later. You take the phone off the hook, yeah, but then it makes a different noise. Eh, 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 noise, right, which is also annoying. <laughs> Sir? 
you uh, turn on the computer, so that is, uh, if you're really talented, you can kind of give your own e back, and uh, uh, we're, we're teaching that actually now in the uh, language department, uh, facts. Uh, so if you're uh, really wide awake, you can uh, plug in your own fax machine. You could call forward, I guess, to your office fax, or maybe to your ex-girlfriend or something, uh, if you don't have that. Um, OK, so uh, those are some solutions. Now, I claim none of those are really great solutions. So what I'd like to do is have you take this perspective of what would Croesus do. And for our modern day Croesus, we'll use Donald Trump. So how would Donald Trump solve this problem? <laughs> By the phone company. OK, you know. Uh, by the way, uh, actually, when Howard Hughes uh, was in his hotel and he decided uh, this was before the VCR uh, and he wanted movies to play, he actually bought the TV station in Las Vegas, called up the general manager and said, tonight, let's watch Casablanca. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, uh, that was the uh, originator of the VCR. Uh, so uh, goodbye, the phone company. Uh, what do we think he actually would do? Find a new wife uh, to answer the phone. Right. Get, an unlisted Get an unlisted number. But it wasn't that this person was calling the number by mistake. Because uh, it wasn't they knew his number and was calling with a fax. It was a mistake. I think the answer is he'd hire an apprentice. right? And the, somebody else would answer the phone for him. The problem with that approach is that we can't do that. right? It's not affordable for us. It's a great solution. It's just not practical. So the question is, who can we hire to be our apprentice? Who can answer the phone for us? An answering machine. The problem is an answering machine doesn't necessarily know which calls to let through and which one's not. An answering service. So doctors use that. And in fact, even the phone company could supply it because we don't need it that often. Or it could be outsourced to Inner Mongolia. They're, open at, they're awake at that time. Um, okay. So we've already come up with much better. I think we can go further. Who do we know is up at that time who could screen our calls for us for free? Outsource. Outsource. Well, that's what we did. We outsourced Inner Mongolia. No, but who do we know will do it for free because they're up? Teenagers. Teenagers, yeah. <laughs> India, so again, they're awake, but they won't quite do it for free. Who do I know must be awake if I'm getting a call? The caller. So why don't I have the caller screen my calls? Seems funny. Well, OK, how about this? It goes into voicemail. They hear the message, hi, you've reached the Trumps. We don't currently wish to be disturbed. If it's an emergency, hit zero. The phone will ring. We'll be mighty annoyed, so it better be good. <laughs> Basically, I've given them all the instructions they need to be my call screener. It won't be perfect, but it'll be pretty good. The fax machine won't know how to get through, whereas emergency calls will know how to get through. Even the right number at the wrong time will know they should leave a message. And that technology already exists, right? Because we have hit zero, and the phone is transferred to my attendant. And since describing this product and this idea in Why Not, in fact, it now is a centerpiece of AT&T's internet uh, tel telephony service, their VOIP service, Call Vantage, uh, where their whole ad is about the mother in Italy who can't quite figure out what time it is in the United States. And so this service is really saving the, uh, the family. Um, Yes, yeah, so the message is in Italian, I guess. Is the... So um, what would Clint Eastwood do in this circumstance? Right, uh, go ahead, uh, make my day. Um, now let me show you how we can use this approach to come up with new products. Mortgage refinancing is a real pain. Right? We have title insurance, appraisers, lawyers. Uh, how would... Uh, how would Donald Trump figure out when is the right time to refinance his mortgage? I'm sorry, sir? When rates, but how does he know that rates are cheap now as opposed to uh, what the yield curve is going to look like, how long the maturity is left on his mortgage, the cost refinancing? I, I think it's pretty clear. He'd hire a group of MBAs to look at what the whole yield curve is going to be the uh, maturity of the mortgages, and figure out when the right time to refinance is. Why not buy some software? Buy some software. Okay, but, 
uh, hire Greenspan, now that he's available. Um, so uh, we can't, so Trump might hire Greenspan. Who could we hire to figure out when we should refinance our mortgage? The bank, right? They're the obvious person. They have all the data. They have our mortgage. They know how long it is remaining, what the interest rates are. So that says we have a new product, the auto refinancing fixed rate mortgage, where the bank refinances our mortgage for us when rates drop. How many of you would like that product? Okay, so I've got a good, I've got, you know, 30, 40%. That's a, that'd be a heck of a market share. Now, I bet there are some bankers in this audience, right? And so, what is your problem with that? <laughs> Cuts into profits, okay? Right? So, did I say that I was going to give this away? <laughs> no. I'm going to have the bank charge me for it. And they could charge me for it when the rates fall. They could say, look, uh, I'm going to charge you an extra half point up front for this option. I'll charge you $1,000 when we do it. Or, I think better still, I'll split the savings with you. When rates fall by 1%, I'll cut your mortgage by half a percent. And so, basically, instead of you having to worry and leave and, hit the and try and find the bottom, don't worry about that. You'll get close to the bottom. You'll never be too far away from the market. And that way, I'll never have to think about the problem. And so what we've done here is created a new product, a one-way adjustable mortgage, a mortgage which basically goes, if you want, one to two, and the way we did it is we start off with a solution that comes from a Trump-like customer and then try and modify it so that it's practical and economic. By the way, Citibank sort of does this today, which is a large number of mortgages in their portfolio are held. And if you call them up to refinance and they happen to be holding your mortgage, you don't have to go through all the trouble. They just do something called a mod, a modification. Uh, and that's actually terrific, because you save the title insurance, the appraisers, and the legal fees, and everything. The only thing they don't do is advertise the fact that they actually hold mortgages in their portfolio, and this is a great service. I'd like to pay them extra so that my mortgage is the one in their portfolio. So the product essentially is there, they just have to now tell us about it. So does it work the other way, that when rates f rise, uh, they would refinance your mortgage? So uh, you think, oh, that's crazy. You know, why, uh, I, of course I wouldn't want to do that. Now that's called, in one sense, an adjustable mortgage, which goes up with it. Uh, the other, and you could even have an adjustable mortgage, which goes up one half as fast, which would work. Uh, and they could give me a discount on that. So a semi-adjustable mortgage, if you'd like. You could also imagine them paying you money to, uh, to refinance your mortgage when rates rise because essentially they've lost money and they can incentivize you to pay off your mortgage, which you might be able to do. My point that I want to emphasize here is that in doing market research, we often go and try and follow the customer, do anthropology work in terms of looking at how people are using products in their home. And a different way of doing that is instead of focus groups and market research, look at this customer in your head. Look at this incredibly empowered Howard Hughes, Donald Trump-like customer. Think about how they would solve the problem, and then go and uh, make it practical. And I did this exercise uh, just last week with Delta Airlines. And uh, here's what we came up with to show you. Um, how would Donald Trump get to the airport? Well, we know that answer. He's uh, driven in a limo. Uh, and, uh, how does my wife get to the airport? Well, I drive her uh, and drop her off. Uh, but that doesn't quite solve my problem. I'd like, uh, the, the closest thing to that would really be valet parking. So that essentially I could go right up to the gate, not have to worry, or right up to the curb, deal with the bags, and they can bring my car away, and then they know when I'm coming back. They could actually have it there for me. And in fact, they could even park it in a distant lot, and it could be cheaper than in fact parking right next to the terminal because I'm away for five days, and you know restaurants have valet parking. Why not airports? Okay. And you could start with that maybe for the premium travelers, the business class travelers. And it turns out for Delta, they've actually laid off so many employees that they now have a very large underutilized parking lot right next to the Atlanta airport. <laughs> and so uh, this may be the uh, one uh, bright moment in that. Uh, okay. uh, that takes us through the first tool the what would Trump do, what would Croesus do. 
Our second tool is to look where incentives are messed up. And as soon as you find the problem, you know how to fix it. So the whole challenge here is finding the problem. If I told you that all restaurants were all you could eat, what would you think about that? It's why we have an obesity problem. Okay? So essentially, you would have an incentive to eat too much. And by the way, we see that at Yale, right? The freshman 10 or 15, uh, in terms of as people come in and go to these all-you-can-eat uh, dorm cafes. Uh, if I told you gasoline were sold on a all-you-could-drive basis, what would you think? Well, you'd be great if you were driving a Hummer and you're driving very long distances. But actually, same problem of incentives, right? That you'd have incentive to drive a car that was not fuel efficient, and you'd have incentive to drive too much. So we can understand that would lead to crazy incentives. Well, think about how insurance is sold. Insurance is sold on a all-you-can-drive basis. The price of insurance is the same if you drive 10,000 miles or 100,000 miles. Uh, actually, there, there's a reduction if you drive below 7,500 miles, and it's a 15% reduction. But between 10,000 miles and 100,000 miles, same price. And in many states, insurance is more expensive than gas. Now, having recognized the mistaken in incentives here, what's the obvious solution? Sell it by the tank full, so you could include it with gas, actually, which is uh, Andy Tobias's proposal. Or what else could you do? Buy the mile, right. Pay for mile, auto insurance. We do that already with car leasing. Because if you go more than 10,000 miles, they charge you 25 cents a mile or 50 cents a mile. And they just look at the odometer. Or it could be done via GPS positioning systems. By the way, women drive half as much as men, get into half as many accidents, and still pay the same amount for auto insurance. So at least half of you in this audience uh, which should be very excited about this product. <laughs> exactly, and the other half are being subsidized. Uh, yeah. Blockbuster used to have as its business strategy uh, managed customer dissatisfaction. And the reason for that is that they were always out of the video you wanted, and the reason for that was that Hollywood would charge them $99 for the tape, they would have to rent it out 50 times in order to get their money back. That meant they'd have very low inventories, one-day rentals, and late fees. No wonder why everybody was unhappy. How do you correct that incentive problem? How do you allow Blockbuster to have lots of tapes? Consignment. But I'm, so what does consignment mean here? Pay per play. Exactly. So essentially revenue sharing. And they switched from the one fee up front to the revenue sharing, 10 bucks for the tape plus a buck a rental. And in the process, they now have uh, guaranteed in stock, uh, seven day rentals, no late fees, and much higher customer satisfaction, and fundamentally higher profits. In fact, that switch turned their business around. Now, it may not save them from video on demand and so on, but as they say, seven fat years are a good preparation for seven lean years. Let me turn the incentive problem a little closer to home. Uh, here at universities, we have trouble with grade inflation. Uh, one of the things I've discovered is that if you give a student an A, they don't complain about their grade, uh, that they um, give you high teaching evaluations, uh, and uh, it helps them get a job. So all of my incentives are to give students high grades. Um, and of course, when everyone does that, in the end, grades don't mean anything. So how is it that you can fix that problem? Pass-fail. Pass-fail. So let's just get rid of grades is sort of the solution. Rank order grading. Rank order grading. Uh, so make the grading so fine that I basically you're not allowing me to make everybody number one. Uh, so I literally, uh, I can't inflate uh, the rank if you want. OK, so that would uh, be a solution. Forced curve. A forced curve, very hard. A forced curve and the rank order are effectively the same uh, solution. I'm sorry, sir? Non-disclosure. So again, get rid of grades in many ways. 
Uh, what I do depends on the purpose. Uh, I'd say there are a couple purposes. One is to actually help evaluate which students are better than others and to force me to also pay attention to what the students are doing uh, in the sense of if I just pass fail, all I have to do is figure are you above the line or below the line? Sir, in the back? Separate the grader from the students. So I grade my class, my colleague's class, he grades my class, that actually would work. Uh, I like that. Uh, it's an accounting strategy, yeah. Uh, let me show you what Indiana University has done. Uh, they put on the student's transcript not only the grade they get in the course, but what all the other students' grades were in that class. So in the capital punishment course, this student who got an A+, plus, there were six other students with that grade, nine with an A, eight with a uh, A-, minus, one with a B+, plus, and so on. That put him in the top six out of 26 students. In contrast, his B plus in the Vietnam War was actually a more impressive grade because it was in the top 56 out of 321. Moreover, you can see that in the history department, the average grade is a 2.36, whereas in the criminal justice department, the average grade was 3.78. So obviously, criminal justice is an easier grading department. Now, you might worry, well, OK, all the students in that class were particularly smart, which is why uh, everybody got an A. So they also tell you what the average grade point average of the other students in that class is in their other courses. And that's that left-hand column. So the average grade point average in criminal justice was 3.01 of the other students in that class. And you also were told how many other students in that course are majors. So 85% of the students in that course were majors, only 12% in the Vietnam War. When you put that amount of information on the transcript, I no longer have any incentive to give everyone an A because in effect, I devalue what it is for the students at the top. And uh, I know many of you either have children in high school or grandchildren in high school. I think this same transcript is actually incredibly important for high schools, uh, whereby you put the whole distribution in the class. Because a poor kid who's in, with a teacher who actually is still a tough teacher and is giving out lots of Bs and Cs and has an impressive grade, you can read that here. And you don't have to suddenly do that hieroglyphics and know that high school, know that teacher in the college admissions office. And I've spoken with Margaret Dahl, uh, and she would be a huge fan of seeing transcripts like this, which I point out is not actually doing class ranking. It's just allowing somebody to appreciate what type of courses a student took and what the teachers were like. And so to the extent you have influence, uh, connections, or interest in helping bring this to various high schools, uh, I would be delighted to work with you uh, to make that happen. Now we turn around and uh, play Jeopardy. At this point, uh, we start with an answer and look for a question. And the way I do that initially is uh, by turning things upside down, or symmetry. So this here <laughs> was the product innovation of the year in 2004. What did Heinz do? Exactly. Many people say they turned the bottle upside down. But I already stored my bottles that way. So my view is they turned the label upside down and made a fatter lid. Uh, and of course, in the process, sell a lot more ketchup, make people happier, and change your theme song from Carly Simon's anticipation to no anticipation. <laughs> Target, or Target, uh, has their whole ad uh, for their pharmacy about turning the medicine bottle upside down so that you have a better way of reading what the uh, medicine is, what the contraindications are, uh, whose medicine it is. Uh, and they believe this is going to dra uh, dramatically reduce the number of mistakes that people uh, make in terms of taking medicine. I, I'm, I'm a yes? <laughs> yes. So the, the wider bottle, because you can read the whole label, the fact that you can read the whole label actually helps reduce the mistakes, because people can read it. Uh, so that's uh, correct. I mean, it's by giving you the billboard space, they can actually put the information in a way that is legible. And that's, uh, of course, what helps. Uh, this is not the greatest picture. I'm sorry about that. Can you tell what this is? It's a Christmas tree that's upside down. It's hanging from the ceiling, which, of course, as you'll note, allows the ornaments to really float very nicely. Uh, it. Uh, 
uh, actually leaves you more space for presents. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, if you live in New York City and you have an apartment there, many people tend to have more ceiling space than floor space. Uh, and, you know, as you're all laughing and saying, oh my God, you know, this is just ridiculous, let me tell you that last year, Hamisher Schlemmer created this product and it was totally sold out and the top selling version at, tar at Target. So, uh, and this is uh, Natalie Jeremijenko's uh, beautiful sculpture at Mass Mocha called Tree Logic, uh, basically upside down uh, trees. Uh, this leads me to the next question. Uh, how do you peel a banana? And I have some uh, strategically placed bananas in the audience. So, uh, so where are you, banana peelers? There we go. Uh, a couple more being handed out now. So uh, how do you peel a banana? From the stem in. So from the bottom or the top? It depends on how you hold it. So like this, right? From the, yes, from the, okay. Don't do it, don't do it, okay? Uh, by the way, this is not the top of the banana. Bananas grow like this. Uh, this is the bottom. So what I'd like you to do is try the following. Put your thumb right here and basically put it in like this. And what you will discover, two pieces, no strings, built-in handle. <laughs> and your first bite is perfect because it's ripe, it's great. And uh, if you had any doubt that this is the right way to eat bananas, this is how monkeys do it. <laughs> and you know, you might think they know something about this. Um, and you know, I can see it now. It's like, I went to Yale, and what did I learn? Uh, <laughs> what do you remember from this talk? Uh, okay. Uh, so tomorrow and the rest of your life, I hope you will try this. Uh, now, my point is not just to teach you how to uh, eat a banana better or to get you some extra potassium. Uh, it is to help remind you of this fact that we get complacent, that we think there's one right way of doing something, and actually, oftentimes, the opposite way may be different, may be better. So do you put milk in your coffee or coffee in your milk? How many people put milk in their coffee? How many people put coffee in their milk? A few of you. Now, why do you do that? You like milk, but which order is, uh, you don't have to stir. Because if you put the coffee in your milk, you don't, it does all the mixing nicely for you, unless you put so much milk in. Uh, and by the way, Dunkin' Donuts switches, gets rid of their Twizzlers, and saves countless pieces of plastic and hours. Okay? So uh, when you eat ice cream, you, know, you tend to put the spoon on your tongue and the ice cream on your palate. What's wrong with that? The taste buds are on your tongue, not your palate. Kids will do it this way. And of course, actually enjoy it a whole lot more until we tell them that that's wrong. Uh, bagel and cream cheese, we tend to eat it like this. The cream cheese is on our palate. Put it like this. Now don't do that at the salmon. Uh, and uh, you'll discover you can use a quarter as much cream cheese and get the same flavor. So a little diet tip here. Uh, how do you eat sushi? Same way, well, most people put the, soy so uh, the rice in, and into the soy sauce wasabi, put the soy sauce wasabi rice on their tongue and the expensive fish on their palate. But in Japan, they do it the other way. The fish goes in the soy sauce, doesn't absorb as much, goes on your tongue, you can then actually experience the texture and the taste of the fish, and the rice is just padding. And so if you're going to spend all that money for sushi, you might as well enjoy it, and actually that means turning it upside down. Uh, name cards. You know, uh, name cards are kind of a challenge here because they're basically way too small. So I can't read your name tag. Uh, and, you know, the thing is, not only are they uh, too small, there's another question. Why are they in the front? Right? They really should be in the back. <laughs> and the reason is, is because here you are at the reunion and I don't really remember you. And it's kind of embarrassing because I've got to go look like this. But in fact, if I could be behind you, say, hey, Bill, <laughs> hey. And it's like I know him, because it's, it's 
So I will encourage you over this weekend to put your name tags on the, uh, on the back uh, and uh, see how that works. Uh, my co-author in this project is a lawyer. Uh, and you know the two of us uh, are constantly annoyed when we see these signs. Management is not responsible for any loss to my personal property for, for uh, use of this establishment, like when you park. So we turned that around. Notice, management by serving me is responsible for any loss to my personal property that results from use of this establishment. They have their sign, I have mine. Uh, we can see who wins. <laughs> and he is a contracts lawyer. Uh, you know, taking uh, things, turning them upside down, uh, leads to interesting results. Here's one from my students. Uh, this is Flasis. These are Limperod tablets. When the moment is wrong, will you be ready? <laughs> you think there's a market for that? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't turn everything upside down. Uh, a microwave. Uh, what does a microwave do? Heats food quickly. Okay. If I flip that, what do I get? Cools food quickly or heats food slowly. So heats food slowly could be the sous vide, this new, very uh, slow type of cooking. Cools food quickly, a macrowave, uh, could be very useful if you have beverages and you want to uh, chill them uh, fast. Now, I don't know if that's a real product, but suddenly I sort of come up with a new idea. Um, Lay's potato chips, their ad campaign is bet you can't eat just one. What would be to flip that? Bet you can eat just one. Okay, how many of you in this audience would prefer a potato chip whose motto was, was true was bet you can eat just one? <laughs> right? Uh, you know, it's sort of basically we can all afford to eat one potato chip. Uh, the issue is if you're telling me I'm going to overindulge and abuse this and go too far, you know, that, then I shouldn't eat it. Uh, but if you tell me it's okay, I can just have one, uh, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, very good no, no, it's yes. I see really lousy potato chips. That's how they do it. Uh, <laughs> now, the way to do it uh, is through portion control. Is to basically wrap potato chips together in sort of a group of three, and so okay, that's uh, that's sort of my dose for the day. Uh, and actually, there's a uh, one big potato chip is the other. <laughs> Uh, it's basically like the bank vault timer that you can only open up at certain hours, uh, would be the notion there. Uh, turning to more serious flips, miles per gallon, what would it be to flip that? Yeah. Gallons per mile. Now, why would we want to, what difference, miles per gallon, gallons per mile? Well, here's the thing. I don't go and say, uh, I'm going to buy 1,000 gallons of gas this year. I wonder how far I can drive. What I say is, I'm going to drive 10,000 miles this year. I wonder how many gallons it's going to take and how much it's going to cost me. And when you do gallons per mile or gallons per 100 miles, actually, now all you have to do is multiply by the price of gas. And we get all excited about things like the Toyota Prius, which go from 40 to 60 miles per gallon, a 50% improvement. And we're hoping there'll be a 100 mile per gallon car. But actually, going from 10 to 15 is four times more important than going from 40 to 60. Because a car that's 10 miles per gallon is using four times as much gas as a car at 40. And so our real focus should be at getting the 10s to 15 rather than the 40 to 60. Or the real place that we need hybrids is around SUVs, not around the subcompacts. And the reason why we don't see that so clearly is because our data is all presented in the miles per gallon. By the way, in Europe, it is, of course, uh, liters per 100 kilometers. Uh, basically gallons per mile. Okay. Uh, Priceline creates a billion dollar business by switching who states the price, the customer to the airline or the airline to the customer. There are 90,000 people on the waiting list for organs in the United States. I'm sure that many of you will have friends and family who are on that list. Those people's lives are being diminished. Some of them die before the organs even become available. Why do we have such a long wait list? Well, 
we don't have enough people who are contributing. Why don't we have enough people contributing? Because we have something in the United States called opt-in. Unless you sign your uniform organ donor card, they can't use your organs. And not enough people sign. What's the flip of opt-in? Opt-out. By the way, we have opt-out for telemarketing, which strikes me as a whole lot less important uh, than organ donation. We have a national opt-out list. Why not a national opt-out list for organ donations? Okay, well, it just, it, it would never work, right? I mean, uh, too complicated, religious problems. Well, actually, Spain, France, Belgium, many countries in Europe not only have opt-out, they've switched from opt-in to opt-out, and in the process, totally eliminated their waiting list. So I put it back to you. Do we think that opt-in is better than opt-out, given the consequences here? You do think opt-in is better? No, opt-out is better, right. So the question is, why can't we make this flip? And actually, I think it's just an issue of timidity, which is that people in Congress think that actually we're happy with the current situation and that they would sort of ruffle feathers. But I believe that if people spoke with their congressmen, senators, their nonprofits, and said, you know, we'd like to see this change and the public is in favor of it, we're all going to be better off. In fact, I've spoken to some Europeans and asked them, did you opt in when it was opt in? And their answer was no. Did you opt out? No. Well, are you happier? And they said, yes, I'm happier on two accounts. One, there's a much better chance I'll get an organ. And two, I'm happier about my own status. I prefer being a potential organ donor, even though I couldn't bring myself to sign that card. And so they're doubly uh, happy in this sense. And by the way, it's a soft opt out. Because so few people opt out, there's so many organs that if somebody objects, you don't even need it. Okay? So in fact, it's not that in the end, an opt out system means we're going to go and take people's organs against their will. It just means you have surpluses, which makes life actually work a whole lot better. Uh, where else would it work? So our last tool is to take an idea in one context and try and apply it in other contexts. So essentially an arbitrage idea. And in that, uh, little things like cup holders. You know, we have cup holders in cars, cup holders in movie cinemas, uh, cup holders on baby strollers. Well, where else could I use a cup holder? Desks, Desks? <laughs> classrooms, beach chair. Beach chair? Beach I'm, I'm sorry, sir? On oh, my belt, <laughs> uh, next to the cell phone. I like that. Uh, my, uh, my preference is actually on airlines. Uh, because it's bumpy, and one of my worst experiences was uh, spilling a whole glass of Coke on the guy next to me, and then actually having to sit next to him uh, for... <laughs> fighting with the elbows and... Uh... Uh, and by the way, there's one airline which does this, it's Air France, they have a hole in the, in the tray table which the glass fits into. Uh, when the tray table flips up, there are these little fingers that come out, and it works terrifically. So it's actually a, a very nice low-tech solution uh, that I think other people could copy. Now, let me pick some bigger ones uh, in terms of ideas. Uh, we have, uh, the government had this really smart idea. They allow people to contribute to an individual retirement account until April 15th. So this year, you could have contributed up to April 15th and deducted on last year's taxes. Why do we do that? Well, they want to encourage savings. And essentially, you're looking for tax breaks any time you can. It's the immediacy as you're doing your taxes. Um, and so, in fact, it works. People save more because they have that ability to get the last minute deduction. I didn't come up with that idea. Well, one sec, please. Um, but where else? What else could I do? What else could I deduct? Yes? Okay. Fine. So we'll, we'll actually get to that, in fact. This is a notion of a lottery ticket as an investment. And in fact, in the current issue of Forbes, I think Ian Ayers have, uh, and I have a, a column talking about that. 
But the obvious thing, charitable contributions, right? That basically uh, you can contribute to charities until April 15th. Now why is that such a smart idea? Well, I claim on December 31st, you're busy, you're traveling, you're stretched because you've given away lots of presents. And by the way, what else? On December 31st, I don't know how much money I've given away. The time that I know how much money I've given away is when I do Schedule A. And so the right time for me to think about my charitable audit is actually around tax time when I'm also looking for other deductions. If you think it's infeasible, last year Congress extended the deadline for charitable contributions to January 31st for tsunami relief. So now all we have to do is extend it to April 15th and make it permanent. So I don't come up with this idea, somebody else, brilliant idea, extended deadline. And then just ask, what else could I apply it to? And as part of that, by the way, we can create a new national norm. How many of you know, what do you think the average charitable giving rate is in the United States? 2%, 5%, 10%? One percent. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. The people in this room don't know, right? Because we have all sorts of different answers here. Whereas, um, how many of you have taught your children what fraction of income you give to charity? So we have a tither, so there's one, uh, but how many of you? Almost none. This is a pretty interesting thing. We've got some of the most philanthropic people in America here, and we're not teaching our children what is a reasonable amount to give to charity. My father told me, you should give till it feels good, which is apparently more than when it hurts. <laughs> um, I actually think this is a failing, uh, that we should be teaching our undergraduates this. We should have a national conversation. The national average is 2%. But if we, and half of that goes to religious organizations, half non-religious. It seems to me that we teach our kids about tipping. We should be teaching them about what an appropriate amount to give to charity is. And, uh, and part of that is understanding what we do as a country, which means when we move the tax date to April 15th for charity, the IRS can publish for each income and each age group what those averages are. And people who are below average can realize they're not doing what they might. It's sort of called social norming. Uh, another example of taking an idea from one context and applying it elsewhere, the Catholic Church has this interesting mechanism. Before they elevate somebody to sainthood, they appoint an advocatus diabli, a, a devil's advocate, somebody who must make sure both sides of the arguments are being heard. In Judaism, before you convict somebody of a capital crime, there must be a non-unanimous vote, which is kind of funny, right? If, I'm, if you're going to fry the guy, you, 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 you're going to want it to be unanimous. But no, no, they say there should be somebody who plays the Henry Fonda role in 12 Angry Men. And then 12 hours later, 24 hours later, it's okay then to have the unanimous vote. In Shakespeare, we have the court jester who can speak up to the king. In the UK, we have question time. So I didn't invent this notion of the devil's advocate, but it seems to work in a lot of different contexts. Where else could we use it that it's not currently being employed? Boardrooms. Boardrooms. It seems to me we don't just need a lead director, we need a devil's advocate director. Uh, or that position could rotate around. Uh, that essentially there isn't enough discussion, that you want to be viewed as loyal, because you want to be in the information loop, but at the same time, uh, we don't always get those challenges. Now, I'm not, many good CEOs will do this as a natural course, but not always and not mechanized. Um, I will tell you that in our tenure discussions, we often know that a candidate is going to go through, and so why annoy your colleagues and uh, let us really have the discussion that we should? Because they'll just get you next time. And in fact, I'm embarrassed to say, but Stanford has advocated a devil's advocate policy in their tenure review cases. Uh, and really, it leads to much better discussion. I've tried to do it here, at least my own part. In terms of the boardroom, uh, Turo, uh, the garden equipment company, actually has institutionalized this. And before they do any merger acquisition, they have a blue team come in and present the other side. Uh, and generally that team loses. But it makes for a better discussion, and they don't always lose. 
So I will encourage you in your organizations uh, to think about how you can have somebody uh, play this role. You can do it all sorts of, have at each meeting, have somebody designated to do this. So, so David Swenson's Yale Endowment has somebody uh, challenge each investment that is part of that. Um, and by Israeli intelligence, does something similar. Uh, so we know it's a useful tool uh, in other contexts, and what I'm suggesting is uh, we can apply it in many more places. This here is uh, one of the most successful inventions of the uh, 90s. Uh, it is the uh, spin pop. It was invented by two postal guys. Uh, it's sort of the Donald Trump lollipop liquor. It spins and you <laughs> hold out your tongue, okay? So you don't have to do a whole lot of work. I mean, because it is that effort. I... Okay. Now, this is a pretty good uh, answer. Uh, it was worth $15 million to the guys who came up with it. And there's the patent for it. And the question is, what other questions could I answer with this? Toothbrush. So it turns out that not the guy who invented this, but the guy who marketed this, John Osher, walked up and down the aisles of Walmart, said, what else could I do with this? And basically came up with the spin brush, which he then sold to P&G for $450 million. Okay. So an answer, but an answer to the wrong question, or a good question, not a great question. Okay. But we can do better still. So there's another product that uses the same motor that had 200 million in sales last year. So you know the answer, you just have to find the question. What is that product? Razor, and that's a vibration, not a spinner. Ear, earwax cleaner, no. Uh, mixer. So uh, here it is, the Dawn Power Spin Brush, which you use for cleaning dishes or cleaning your toilets. Please buy two. <laughs> um, one of the things I believe in terms of getting folks to talk about ideas is really having an open source movement for ideas where you share your ideas, you comment on other people's ideas. The problem with most suggestion boxes is you put the idea in there and you never quite know what happens to it. And so what I'm going to propose here uh, is something, a website I created called uh, whynot.net. I'll encourage you to go visit it, uh, where people put up their ideas and uh, share them, discuss them, improve upon them. The, the most popular idea there is better brake lights brake lights that shine red and, and bright when you st slam on the brakes. And then somebody else says, well, why don't they change color? Why don't they go from green to red? Uh, why don't they flash? Oh, let's not just have a visual sign. Let's have an audible sign. Let's have a rear-facing horn. And so when I slam on the brakes, the horn will also go off backwards. Okay. Uh, and somebody says, well, we could have horns with different sounds. Sorry. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, another idea that I really like that somebody proposed, um, they have the audio tours, like the MP3 tours that you get, in, oh, sorry, the audio tours in a museum. Let's convert those to other places. And in fact, uh, with a little prodding, uh, Yale now has MP3 downloadable tours that you can walk around campus. And those tours will soon be in Chinese, Spanish, French, Italian, uh, and many African languages. And hopefully soon enough, we'll have Vince Scully architecture tour of New Haven, a Doug Gray business tour of New Haven, uh, a tour of the green, and uh, basically you can just enjoy the city that way, uh, wherever and whenever you are. Uh, airport charity. One of the things that uh, you know, we all hate, of course, is going through those metal detectors, but what about having a charity collection place for coins? So that as you're emptying out your pocket of coins, you can actually now feel good about that. You can contribute to the March of Dimes. Uh, and by the way, they have this in foreign airports. When you're going to go through an international flight, they often give you an opportunity to get rid of your foreign change. What I'm suggesting is in every airport, 
as you're going through security, here's now an opportunity to feel good. We brought this idea to Yale internally, and Yale employees were given opportunities to talk about ways to improve Yale. And my favorite, and the one I think you'll uh, like, is uh, allowing you to co-invest with the Yale Endowment. Right? How many of you would like to do that? Right? Two hands here. I can see that. Uh, now, uh, David Swenson responded uh, that he doesn't want to have to invest thinking about taxes. Okay, I, that, that's a fair point. So you. We get some feedback, and so then the response is, well, what about 401k plans? And somebody else says, well, you shouldn't put all your 401k plan with your, with your employer. And then somebody else says, well, actually, it's not really with Yale. It's sort of with private equity, real estate, stocks. So we're actually not buying the stock of Yale. We're actually buying a very well-diversified portfolio. Uh, and in fact, I think allowing employees, especially union employees, to put their pensions in 401k plans with the Yale Endowment would do fabulous things for labor relations. Because when the, you, when the endowment grows, they'll actually be cheering it and rooting it along rather than saying, no, this is a time for a labor action. Alumni as well. Alumni as well. And you, it, the money's already there. How convenient. Uh, so uh, I encourage you to encourage uh, the Yale administration to go and make this happen. Uh, I've been involved in a few why nots. Uh, the first is uh, home equity insurance. The, uh, for most people, their ho your home is your single largest asset. It's highly undiversified and highly leveraged, which means if prices go up, you make a ton of money. But if prices fall, you're in trouble. You can't move, you can't refinance. And so we get insurance against fire, against theft, against losing a cell phone. Why not insurance against losing money on your home? And working with Neighborhood Reinvestment and HUD, and some of my colleagues here at Yale, we have now made this product real. If you live in Syracuse, New York, for 1.5%, you can buy protection against losing money in your home. And that's helped turn the market in Syracuse around. Because you could buy a four-bedroom corner lot house for $70,000, and people wouldn't do it. Because for the last 10 years, everyone they knew had lost money in their home. And generally, when prices fall, demand goes up, but not with housing, because people don't want to catch a falling knife. When they know there's insurance, they're willing to buy into the declining market. And so I'd like to see this as a much broader kind of product. Uh, working with a student, uh, Seth Goldman, uh, we decided that uh, there should be a tea that actually tastes like tea uh, rather than liquid candy. Uh, the first lesson we teach people in economics is something called declining marginal utility. The first teaspoon of sugar tastes good. It gets rid of the bitterness. The second teaspoon's OK. But by the time you put in 10 teaspoons, especially of high fructose corn syrup, you've made it liquid candy, nothing that tastes like tea. And so we decided that we would make a tea with just a very small amount of sugar. Uh, and um, that was now eight years ago. I'm uh, pleased to report, maybe even bragging, uh, that in the current issue of Consumer Reports, we are now the top-ranked iced tea in the market, uh, that we're actually the number one product in uh, the Natural Foods Channel. Uh, and I hope at the end of this talk, uh, you will enjoy some of our products, which I brought here uh, in the front. Uh, and uh, of course, there's no particular reason uh, why somebody couldn't have done it, but you had to ask, why not? And then in terms of here at Yale, um, I thought it'd be, uh, I'd like to bring really smart undergraduates into the uh, management school. Uh, and the problem is that if you get an MBA without work experience, well, uh, nobody will really hire you because they won't pay you an MBA salary if you have no work. So how do I take somebody right out of college and get them through the MBA? And the solution in my view, was they should come to the MBA program for a year, where we teach them some accounting, some finance, and marketing. And then after that, they can go for work for a year or two. Now the work experience they'll get will be a much better work experience, because they'll know something. And then they can come back and finish their MBA in nine months. And so it's a lot less disruptive to their career, because their first year is really like a fifth year of college. And I'm pleased to say that we've now done this program for four years. The first people going through have now all graduated, have gotten fabulous jobs, they've gotten great internships. 
I'll encourage you as Yale alums to go and hire some of these folks, uh, both for their intermediate job, where you can get a really smart person uh, doing an internship, and you know what, I even see one Silver Scholar here. So if you want to hire Adrian, uh, this is a, a great candidate, uh, and uh, you can uh, meet her after this talk. Uh, I also think that uh, we could do some, uh, something really clever with the maternity MBAs. Every time a woman leaves the labor force to have a child or get an MBA, uh, this is very disruptive to her career. So why not do a twofer? Uh, go and have a kid and get your MBA. Uh, and uh, the idea would be that we design a program that you could do over two years, three years, two and a half, your call, where uh, we'd be a little bit more flexible in terms of how many classes you take. We provide great child care on site uh, and encourage you to do these things all at once. And by the way, many of our students now, about five or six a year, do do that, but we make no accommodation for it. So why not actually do it in a way that we're designed to make that happen? Um, let me end just uh, with a, uh, a lesson, uh, a mantra uh, from Gandhi. Uh, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. I hope you will work with me in bringing some of the, these ideas to reality. Uh, it's fun. It's possible. You just keep, have to say, why not? Why not indeed? Thank you very much. Um, a couple other little announcements. I have, um, I'll take, I think we have time for one or two questions. And if you want to ask questions, if you'd be kind enough to come up to these microphones, that would help. Uh, also, after the talk, I do have some copies of Why Not and uh, some of my earlier books, Co-Opetition and Thinking Strategically. Uh, and uh, we'll do some revenue sharing where some of it goes to me and some of it goes to the alumni fund. And so uh, I'm happy to help out that way too. Uh, sir. Could you talk a little bit about problem identification? And let me just give you an example of what I mean. We talked about refinancing mortgages. Maybe the problem might be how does the bank, how, does, how do banks and customers share profits? Mm -hmm. Or another example in your talk, we talked about how do I find a, a devil's advocate to put on the board? The question might be how do we create a devil's advocate culture? So my question is, can you talk a little bit about identifying the problem? Um, it is. Um, and, and let me say, the Why Not website is also part of changing that culture. There are a lot of people who are why noters, I'll call them, out there. Uh, and they kind of get beaten down. Oh, if this was such a good idea, why hasn't it already happened? Or what's something called WICSIC. We couldn't, so you can't. Um, and when you discover, you know, somebody else had that idea. Maybe it really isn't so crazy. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Or the big problem is oftentimes you have an idea, but you're the wrong person for it. So one of my favorites is colored salt. I think it'd be a great product. But if I brought it to market, in the end, all I'd be doing is test marketing for Morton's. Uh, because if it worked, they'd just go and make it happen. And so part of this culture is getting people to talk about ideas, commenting on each other's ideas, not having them be black boxes, uh, creating the mechanisms which allow us to develop people's skills as generators, commentators, or if you like, devil's advocates. Uh, in terms of thinking about how to do the uh, revenue splitting, my general view is that, uh, and this is from Coopetition, uh, there's two activities in life. There's creating value and there's capturing it, both of which are challenges. We tend to focus too much on the capturing value as opposed to the creating value. And so uh, if, in fact, uh, with the refinancing mortgage, the point was not to take money away from the banks. It was away from the title insurance guys, the appraisers, and the lawyers. Sorry about that. Uh, and once I made that pie bigger, now we're going to share it. It doesn't matter to me how we share it between customers uh, and the bank. And then we'll take these two and then we'll be done. Sir, ma'am? Hi. Um, I came to your talk two years ago, uh -oh. and I just wanted to tell you I was so inspired by your talk. Um, when you ended your talk with what could we do new at reunions, um, I came up with an idea, and I just wanted Great. to share it Please. because it's happening today. Um, at the time, I was worried about the state of the world. It was not very long after 9-11. And after listening to the professor, I thought, wow, I'm surrounded by all 
my fellow alumni who are talented and capable. What if we all work together to try to create change? So my classmates and I talked about it, and we're having a meeting at this reunion at 2.30 in WLH Harkness Hall today. And I want to invite all of you to come to try to create Yale project teams to make the world better. So I hope you'll come and join us. WLH 2.30? Uh, at 2.30, room 120. Room 120. Thank okay, you so much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Professor Nailboff. What are you doing in New Haven when we really need you in Washington? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a social security system. There are a few other 50ths here, where after the baby boom generation, a smaller number of workers are going to be supporting a larger number of recipients. Are we doing something wrong, and what do we need to do to fix it? Yeah. Um, so let me say, I, I, um, we actually do try and uh, work on very big problems, a la Social Security, Mideast Peace, and so on. Uh, to your comment about culture, part of I think what we need to do is also solve manageable problems where the solutions are pretty easy uh, and show that we can actually make changes, and then we move to the intractable ones. Yeah. Uh, I have some things that we've done in terms of Social Security. One is I believe all pension plans should be opt out rather than opt in that the default for people, so at least the 401k plans can be working yeah. much better, and those defaults should not be into 2% contribution, and should not be into money market fund, they should be 6% contribution into all equity funds. Uh, secondly, we've uh, had this uh, proposal uh, that actually lottery tickets, uh, half the money goes to education. We like to see the losing part, that 50 cents, go into a person's own savings account. And the reason is that basically, we don't reward people for savings. We don't make it kind of fun. And so here's the deal. Save a buck, 50 cents goes into your account, you have a chance of winning a million, and there's some amount that covers an admin. And so trying to find ways to take what people are already doing now and saying, how can we use that to actually help themselves? Uh, and lastly, of course, and most importantly, uh, is have an honest discussion about this. Uh, and uh, I thank you for uh, bring that up. So I'm going to be here. I'll sign some books, enjoy some tea. I think I'll be out in the back doing that. They need the price of the books. Uh, oh, I, okay. It's uh, it's ten dollars for why not and fifteen for the other two. Uh, and uh, Adrian, if you'd help out being a bank on that, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, all.